Please rise. Court is now in session. All rise. All rise. Is it legal to? A regular look at the legal system and you, a special production of the Missouri Bar. I'm Bob Pretty. And I'm Farrah Fight, the movie 925, and the television shows such as Mad Men and the story of Mary Richards trying to make it on her own in a 1970s television newsroom are examples of office climates of the past. Or are they? A few years ago, the Me Too movement began forcing a lot of people to examine their past behaviors in the workplace, whether they acted in discriminatory or harassing ways, and examinations by others who thought such things were just the way things were and should not have been. This is a different day, and today we are going to explore workplace discrimination with Camille Rowe of Kansas City. She's a senior litigation associate at Armstrong Teasdale, a 120-year-old law firm. Her practice covers both state and federal employment litigation. She's handled cases involving race, age, disability, and sex discrimination, and sexual harassment and retaliatory firing. She also does employee training seminars and harassment investigations. Camille, we're glad to have you with us on the program today. Well, thank you for having me. I am very glad to be here and love to discuss with you all all of the intricacies of, (laughs) you know, showing up to work every day and what folks should be on the lookout for with respect to interpersonal relationships and just employment in general. We don't know if we're going to get to cover all of them, but we're going to cover a lot. Let's start with a little background. The, uh, the workplace today is a far cry from the workplace of 1970 or 1990 or even 2010. We're going to see if you can discuss how much the climate has changed, especially in the last few decades. Absolutely. So if we sort of start with the immediate present, we know that right now with the pandemic that we are still sort of trying to make our way out of, that workplaces have changed a lot because a lot of them are now in a hybrid format. So what that means is is that you may have some people showing up to the office and you may have others that are working from home. That particular makeup has created its own set of challenges for employers as well as employees. If we kind of go a little bit away from that and look at how the workplace has changed, I would say, you know, within the last five to 10 years prior to the pandemic, I think there has been a focus really on uh, more inclusive work environments and environments that have cultural sensitivities to individuals who come from different backgrounds, different races, ethnicities, things of that nature. Bob, you mentioned earlier the Me Too movement, which is something that was kind of at its height prior to the pandemic. And I think that has also influenced how employers interact with their employees and even how employees interact with each other. So there's been, I would say, quite a bit of, I would say, progress in certain areas, awareness about how to interact in the workplace. And so with that, you have employers who become more cognizant of their policies and their procedures. And then you have employees, I think, who have become more aware of how they're interacting with and among each other. I wanted to ask you about some terms that we routinely hear kind of tossed about either in media reports or other descriptions. And those are the phrases that seem interchangeable, workplace discrimination and workplace harassment or harassment for our friends across the pond. How are they different or are they? They are different. So we'll take workplace discrimination first. So workplace discrimination, if I had to sort of summarize it at a high level, deals with behaviors or actions where you could be mistreating someone based on a protected characteristic. And so protected characteristic is a term of art, and there are very specific characteristics that fall under um, that term. So race, color, national origin, religion, whether or not someone has a disability, and sort of depending on where you are, in some places it could be sexual orientation or gender identity. So with respect to discrimination, if you have someone who falls within one of those categories and that person, you know, feels like they are being somehow mistreated in the workplace because of that protected characteristic, then you likely have or you could potentially have a situation where we're dealing with discrimination. Harassment is a bit different. Harassment is, again, it could be based on one of those protected characteristics, but it is usually some sort of prolonged activity 
where that person is subjected to, it could be name calling, it could be off color jokes, it could be a variety of things, but something that sort of prolongs over a period of time that creates what's called a hostile work environment. It makes that person just completely uncomfortable to come to work. It might affect their ability to do their job. And then within harassment, there's sort of this subset of sexual harassment, which is usually based on a person's gender. And contrary to popular belief, while we know usually it's a woman that's subjected to that type of harassment, it can also be a man. You so, anticipated our next question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and so I do want to make one clarification yeah. with respect to discrimination. Discrimination usually is some really discreet act, like a very okay. specific act. So maybe someone doesn't get a job because of the protected characteristic, or maybe someone isn't hired because of the protected characteristic. And so, again, kind of making sure that we keep those two things, discrimination and harassment, sort of distinct from one another. Usually the discrimination could be characterized as a very specific, ad, what we call it adverse action, right? So I didn't hire you or, you know, or perhaps I fired you. And the reason why I did it was because you're someone who, who falls under this, one of these protected categories. Could maybe missing out on a promotion also be tied to that? Yeah, so okay. that, that could be tied to discrimination as well. Yes. On the way to this recording session. I stopped to get some gas today, and the guy ahead of me in line was talking to the woman at the cash register who was asking about his sister who had been fired because she was gay. But they managed to cover it up by using some other phrases that hid the fact. How hard is it to get to a case like that and and show that it's not the stated reason, but the real reason? Yeah. So, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, just in my experience, which, you know, my background is, is litigation. And so I have the job of really looking at these types of cases where it is usually not obvious, you know, at first blush that the protected characteristic is the reason. And so it requires most certainly an investigation into Maybe, you know, this employee's performance history. Is this an employee that always performed well and always got great reviews and everyone has these very nice and glowing things to say? Well, then you have to ask yourself, well, if that's the case, why is it that this person, you know, was terminated? Was the termination reason another term of art what we call pretextual? And so you kind of have to dig in and get to the bottom of that. You may speak with supervisors and see whether or not they have some sort of some sort of animus toward a person in that protected category. It's usually not going to be obvious. And so, you know, sometimes defending these cases can be difficult because of that. It's probably not so much the case now, but there was a time where people were not as vocal about their prejudices and their biases. We've had a bit of a shift here recently, but the truth of the matter is, is that most people are not going to come right out and say, I don't like black people or I don't like women. There's usually going to be a, a circumstantial case where you kind of have to piece the facts together in order to come to the conclusion that someone you know, was terminated because they are in a protected class. In recent years, I think I and a lot of the public have learned a lot of, about how to distinguish known biases, biases that we may have, so our conscious bias. And then we hear the term implicit bias. So those are the biases that we have that we just don't even realize that we have them. Can discrimination also occur because of those implicit biases? And are you held to the same standard? I would say that is that is one of the very difficult things to sort of pin down, right? Because at the end of the day, we all have implicit biases that we are not necessarily aware of. And so because of the fact that it's a situation that isn't, you know, very prevalent, I don't know how one would be able to demonstrate, first of all, what the implicit bias might be for a particular person, okay. right? So you're going to have to have some sort of information or evidence that may create a pattern, for example. So if you have a I hate to use race, but that's just the easiest thing. As an African-American woman, I can relate to that or gender. But if you have a situation or a fact pattern where, you know, maybe you have a Caucasian manager who, for whatever reason, has interviewed a percentage 
and maybe a high percentage of African-American folks that he's never hired and his team is made up of all Caucasian people, then at that point you have the information where you might be able to at least make the argument that there could be some implicit bias against race. But again, you have to have some sort of tangible evidence to be able to connect those dots. How often does somebody in your position, and maybe there are special folks, but how often does this kind of situation show up that you can go in and sit down and talk to this person and say, you know, you've got a problem here and you need to find a way to avoid that problem before it comes around and bites you? Is, is there counseling that's involved that can that can work through this kind of situation you just talked about? That there is, but again, you have to be in a situation where you're alerted to the problem, right? And so what I found in my experience is that sometimes people are not vocal about maybe what they see going on in their environment, right? If you see the pattern as an individual, are you alerting those people in management? Are you saying anything to the folks in human resources so that they can then sort of take a step back and maybe go look at the data and try to figure it out. There are certain employers who are required to report on numbers, the demographics of applicants versus who's hired, but that is a a very specific area. I believe uh, federal contractors have to provide that type of information. It's not information that all employers are required to um, produce. So in the situation of, of federal contractors, they're going to have the data. Other employers, smaller businesses, they're not. And so at at that point, one of the mechanisms they would have in order to be alerted if there's an issue is if, you know, perhaps their employees notice that there's an issue. The last point at which they might be alerted is if someone decides to file a charge or a lawsuit um, because they feel like they were not fairly treated whether it be um, in the application process or they weren't fairly treated once they became an employee. And usually that's, you know, where the information might reveal itself. And in those situations, you know, I have had to kind of have a conversation with management or an HR individual to just kind of like say, hey, this is the data. This is what the data reflects. And so you got, you guys may want to go back and kind of look at your policies or look at how things are being handled from you know, either an onboarding, a hiring, or an application process. In your experience, how often, though, is there an action filed after an employee has noticed a problem but has never brought it to the attention of their superiors and tried to work through it, and finally gets to the point where the employee just says, I'm going to sue them? It happens. It happens quite a bit, right? So Constitution says everyone has their right to their day in court. And in my opinion, we live in a very litigious society. So I've seen the lawsuits have haven't been filed where the employer was never given any sort of notice, whether it be an individual who felt like they were experiencing discrimination or they felt like they were being harassed rather than go through the, the process to file a complaint and allow the employer to address it. They skip that step and then go straight you know, to you know, an investigative agency and file their charge. And so, you know, in those cases, it's certainly unfortunate because usually employers have complaint procedures in place and policies that explain that they prohibit any sort of discrimination or harassment. And I encourage employees to read your handbooks because the employers are giving you the handbooks for a reason to educate you about what your recourse is if you do find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're being mistreated. But when employees sort of skip that internal step and don't give the employer notice, it actually, you know, kind of gives the employer a leg up because it's like, well, if you didn't tell me, I didn't know and I didn't have an opportunity to correct it, right? Right. You didn't have the chance to do better. Exactly. And so it's it's important. I mean, unless it is a situation where the employer should have known and it was super obvious in those types of situations, I don't want to say that they're rare, but if, for example, it's a member of management that's engaging in the activity, this discrimination or the harassment, then usually the employer is kind of stuck. If yeah. this person is engaging in these bad acts and you're a member of your management team, your, the employer sort of that that knowledge is imputed on the employer, but in situations where maybe it's 
another employee that could be harassing a coworker. You know, you definitely want to make sure that you are following the complaint procedure and alerting the employer to the issue so that they can correct the, the problem. Are people afraid to do that, though? They are. I've had a lot of conversations with people who describe to me the issues that they're experiencing in the workplace. And my advice is always, you know, you have to say something. But these are folks who are relying on these jobs, you know, to sustain their families or, you know, for what for whatever the reason might be. They don't want to ruffle feathers or, you know, anything like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you tell the employer what's going on, give them the opportunity. And I suppose in the event something, some sort of retribution comes to you, that's absolutely not a good thing for the employer. But then just as a practical matter, is that a place that you want to be at anyway, right? So, And, and then you want to be known as someone who gets litigious with somebody right off the bat. Right. So there are a ton of, I think, considerations for both sides in these situations. Although I, I do litigate and I do find myself in adversarial positions, I'm very much, I'm a peacemaker. I'm like, I feel like there's a way we can figure out what the issue is. We can address the problem and everyone should be able to live harmoniously. That's how I like to think of things. But at the end of the day, you have to give each other that chance. We typically talk to most of our guests about Missouri law or federal law, where it's only dealt with like bankruptcy or veterans benefits, those types of things at the federal level. Is employment law both at the state and federal level? And are there different categories or protected characteristics and processes that you follow? And how do you know where to even begin? So, yes. So there is there are federal discrimination statutes. I like to call them alphabet soup. Um, of course, Title VII, which I think most people are familiar with, um, which deals with um, things like race, national origin, gender. Oh, there's probably one is more. Is age one of those? So age is actually a separate oh, okay. statute, separate federal statute, ADEA. Okay. I had a friend, when I reached my 40th birthday milestone, be like, congratulations, you're a protected class now. <laughs> that is true. And you're actually a protected class under the federal statute as well as under... Missouri's state discrimination statute. So on the federal side, there's also a separate statute for that prohibits disability discrimination. There is a separate sort of sub statute, I'll call it, that protects against discrimination based on pregnancy. So, you know, the federal level, there are actually quite a few, you know, others. In the state of Missouri, we have the Missouri Human Rights Act. So that's our state statute um, that addresses sort of all those protected categories with the exception of gender orientation. And then I believe in Kansas or Kansas City and in St. Louis. Sexual orientation, I think. Yes. So there are ordinances in Kansas, Kansas City. I don't know why I keep saying Kansas because I am not a fan of Kansas at all. (laughs) I just want to make that very clear. But in Kansas City and in St. Louis, and I think perhaps also Columbia, there may be ordinances that protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation. So you're dealing with these hierarchies of laws and ordinances that provide these protections for folks who fall in those protected categories. And employers in these areas are are aware that these laws exist. So I would like to think that they are doing their best to comply and make sure that their employees are aware of the protections as well. In your experience, where does Missouri law need to be improved the most? Oh, that's a loaded question. Yes. Bob. <laughs> my personal opinion, which is not the opinion of my law firm, Armstrong Teasdale. <laughs> or the Missouri Bar. Or the Missouri Bar. I think that we most certainly need to work on expanding the protections for orientation, gender identity, things of that nature. I I know it's a hot topic and I know it is a very polarizing topic, but again, my personal opinion is I feel like folks should feel comfortable to be who they are. It's a, it's, and I hate to get religious, but we all have free will. Call it what you want. I feel like it's probably called something else depending on, you know, what you're, religious walk might be. But at the end of the day, ideally with like a utopian world where a person can feel comfortable being exactly who they are. And, you know, they don't have to shield or hide that 
in order to move about and do the everyday things that everyone wants to be able to do. We have a case back in Jefferson City where one of our schools district or one of our school boards has been arguing about the use of bathrooms by, by folks who were born one sex and, and so on. Is this just a matter of the topic being so fresh and so raw in front of us that just we need just time to feel comfortable about talking about it? Or is it more than that? I, I think it's, it's more than that. I have to acknowledge that everyone has sort of their, their upbringing and what they have sort of known or, or that they are accustomed to. But we have individuals who have their experiences that are going to, my experience is different from your experience, Ferris, different from your experience, Bob. But I think being able to converse about those experiences and try to come to some sort of middle ground or understanding about how our experiences most definitely, you know, shape us, but those experiences can coexist without, I think the, there's a fear of if you allow someone who has a different gender identity or maybe who feels they identify a different way, associating with someone who sort of identifies in what would be considered normal, and I'm putting normal in quotation marks, that that's somehow going to influence that other person. I personally don't think that's the case, but I think that's kind of the fear that by allowing everyone to coexist in that way, that it's that it's somehow bad or that it's somehow going to taint someone else in a particular way. I mean, time most definitely because we see that people's attitudes towards things do change. But I think part of the reason why attitudes towards these things change is because people are educated or they get to know somebody who might be a little bit different from them and they get to see that person in a different perspective. And so I think it just needs to be more of an interaction and an exchange of ideas and folks being a little bit more open to something that is not what they consider to be normal. This sounds like a good time for a segment we call Legal Ease with retired Supreme Court Judge Mike Wolf. Legal Ease, that means we ask Judge Wolf to translate the lawyer's language into English. Judge? Legal Ease. Those of you who have served on jury duty have experienced the ultimate in democracy. The idea that a group of citizens can decide the outcome of a legal case after they've been instructed on the law by a judge. In civil cases where a person or company seeks money from another for a wrong that they have suffered, the jurors assess the conduct of the person or company being sued, and if they find them at fault, the jurors can decide how much money should be paid as compensation, and in a few cases, money to be paid as punishment for unlawful behavior. We have exalted the jury to the point that our law says that facts found by juries shall not be re-examined except as the law provides which mostly involves the question of whether a judge has properly instructed the jury as to the law. In criminal cases, the jury stands between the government and the accused. If the jury says not guilty, that is the end of the case. The role of the jurors is very powerful, which makes it interesting to examine what role juries play in workplace and employment discrimination cases. In the federal courts, the Seventh Amendment to the United States Constitution provides the right of trial by jury in cases brought at common law typically for money damages. Cases that seek relief in equity, that is, commonly injunctions, are tried to judges without juries. Mostly these are for historical reasons. So when the United States Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the legislators' concern was that jurors in parts of the United States, especially in the old Confederacy, might not judge fairly the discrimination claims of blacks. This period was before the Voting Rights Act, which enfranchised blacks throughout the country and made it more likely that they would be serving as jurors. In 1964, through much of the South, juries were all white. So Congress, in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, said persons discriminated against in employment on the basis of race, sex, national origin, could get relief in equity, back pay, reinstatement, typically. But these were not labeled as money damages, and hence they were decided by judges without juries. Fast forward a quarter of a century or so and look at the effects of the Voting Rights and other Civil Rights Acts, as well as changing standards of society. Juries have become more broadly representative of the people which, in turn, 
were believed to provide less biased juries to decide discrimination cases. So Congress in 1991 provided for the awarding of money damages in employment discrimination cases based on race, sex, national origin, and thus jury trials were an option for parties litigating employment cases. Congress already had provided for money damages, and hence juries, in the Age Discrimination and Employment Act dating back to the 1970s, and later in cases involving disability discrimination. Take age, for instance. Congress was not terribly concerned that jurors would be unsympathetic to those claiming discrimination based on age. All of us are going to get old, and most of us can emphasize with those who claim legitimately to have been discriminated against for being old, which begins, sadly enough, at age 40. There is a similar history of discrimination claims under Missouri's Human Rights Act, which was enacted in the 1980s and provides money damages remedies for those who prove discrimination in employment. When the Missouri Act first passed, it provided for cases to be tried to juries, but the governor vetoed it because of the jury trial provisions. The legislature passed the law without providing for jury trials, and state trial courts and the Court of Appeals held that employment cases had no right to trial by jury. But wait, Missouri has a constitution too, and our constitution says, quote, the right of trial by jury, as heretofore enjoyed, shall remain inviolate. Close quote. As heretofore enjoyed means we look back to the beginning of our statehood, 1820, and determine whether a particular case was the kind of case that would be tried to a jury under the common law. The Missouri Supreme Court held that a case seeking damages for employment discrimination is analogous to the common law claims and is indeed to be tried to a jury. That case was state in the relation of Catherine Deal versus O'Malley. It's a unanimous opinion of the Missouri Supreme Court, an opinion that I was pleased to say that I wrote. This right to trial by jury affects how employees and employers view employment decisions, including in the vast majority of situations that do not involve legal trials. In the end, employers and employees alike know that juries will decide claims of a discrimination, juries of randomly selected ordinary citizens, and not by judges alone. So it is sensible to ask at the outset would a group of ordinary folks see the decision to fire an employee, for example, as an act of discrimination. Such cases are investigated at the State Commission on Human Rights, and after that the employee claiming to be injured by discrimination usually has to get a lawyer and go to court if the claim is not settled at the commission level. So does all of this affect how employees are treated? Probably. Many people have served on juries or know people who have served. They may trust and have confidence in their fellow citizens that is greater than their trust in judges and experts. It is through the experience of conducting and observing jury trials in employment cases that we lawyers and business executives learn how ordinary citizens feel and act upon claims of discrimination. This may not be a perfect system. No human system is, but it is democratic. The system allows regular people, not highly trained judges or other experts, to have a major say in how people are treated in the workplace. This is Mike Wolf, speaking up for the people. Legal ease. I often think, and I know that over different points in my work, I had a male office mate at one time that I joked to my husband that he was my work boyfriend because I spent more waking hours in a week, I think, with him, especially when we were doing overtime for different projects, than I got to spend with my husband or my spouse. What are some recommendations that you have, since I know you have experience both in representing businesses and individuals, for both individuals and businesses uh, to keep in mind about how to make sure that their workplace, where they spend so much of their lives at, can be a safe space for them? I think you hear a lot about um, folks talking about like inclusivity and things of that nature, um, and it is a very you know, nice ideal, but it's something that you certainly want to put into practice creating a work environment um, that is is collegial and that is open to you know different perspectives and that allows those perspectives to be shared with respect. I am fortunate enough to have worked in some really great environments with people from really all walks of life and I personally come into a workplace with a certain level of 
of curiosity. Like I don't want to be nosy. If you don't want to share, you don't have to, but I also want to be open to allow you to be able to share if you want to. And sometimes it has to be sort of openly said, like this is this is a judgment-free zone. We're here to work, of course, but we're not here to make any judgments about sort of what you're what you're doing personally, so long as you're not breaking the law. And so it's, it's hard to sort of say specifically, you need to do this thing, you know, or the third or whatever, but just making sure that, you know, your mission and your values reflect a workplace that is inclusive, that is without judgment, that is for, focused more so on the work, whatever that work might be, and encourages interactions and feedback amongst the workforce, is my opinion. Do very many employers hold uh, workplace discrimination and harassment seminars or workshops for their employees? In my experience, they do. Any any uh, employer who that I work with generally will train employees um, during the onboarding process. So once they start at mm-hmm. the job, mm-hmm. again, the employee handbook is another way for employers to communicate the policies and to make sure that the employees have the policies. A lot of employers that I work with tend to do annual training on discrimination and harassment, and there are actually a lot of states that require that annual training. And then in the unfortunate event, you have someone who maybe engages in some sort of conduct that could constitute a violation of the policy, then usually there's individual training for that person or persons who are engaged in that conduct or you know might be part of a situation that maybe kind of looks like it could be a, po- a policy violation. If I'm an employee and I feel picked on, either harassed or discriminated against, who's the first person I should talk to? So what, Just kind of walk us yeah, through what we yeah, ought to do. Absolutely. The first person you should talk to is the person that's engaging in the behavior. Oh, really? Not your HR? Department. I mean, you certainly can. Okay. You don't have to go to that person, but sometimes... Simply saying to the person who is engaging in the behavior, like, look, I don't know if you're having a bad day. I don't know what it is, but what you're doing is offensive to me. And sometimes that is enough to have the behavior stop. I know some people are not as assertive and maybe don't feel comfortable approaching the person that's engaging in the behavior. So at that point, absolutely. You go to your manager, your immediate supervisor, or you go to your human resources personnel and let them know that this is what you're experiencing. I would also recommend, you know, reading again the handbook because usually there's a complaint procedure and sometimes there's a requirement that you put your complaint in writing. So as an employee, you want to be educated about, you know, what the complaint process is. Sometimes the handbooks may also outline what the investigation process is. And so you're educated about what to expect, and then you're also, you know, empowered to kind of question if what you're sort of told in the handbook is supposed to happen, if that's not sort of matching what's actually happening, you can ask those questions and sort of make sure that the employer is being honest with respect to how how they are advertising and then following their policies. If I have reached out, followed those steps, followed the employee handbook, should I talk to other people at my work about it to see if they if they're if they're witnessing it or if it's happened to them too or then or should I be doing something else before I do that? So I understand in a workplace, you know, you may have like your workplace friends or your workplace yes. boyfriend, and I feel the like folks you vent to, right? <laughs> What's that? The folks you vent to, yeah, right? the folks you vent to, and I mean, I, there's nothing that it's not a right or wrong answer to that. Okay, if you are having conversations with your coworkers and they have witnessed what's going on. I mean, that's important just because those are folks that you're going to want to communicate to HR as having been witnesses. But if they're just simply coworkers who don't have any firsthand knowledge of what's going on, I mean, all you're doing at that point maybe is simply venting to them. It's possible, though, in venting to them, they may take your complaint to HR. So, I mean, there's a a lot of different ways that that scenario could play out. But if the ultimate goal is to seek sort of some sort of redress for what's happening to you, venting to your coworkers is is not necessarily a way to get to that end. 
if you have maybe talked with a person engaging in the behavior, if you've escalated it to management, if you've escalated it to HR, if you've sort of exhausted all of your channels internally within the company and don't feel satisfied with the response you're getting or the action at that point, sad to say, then your next step would be to reach out to one of the administrative agencies that are responsible for investigating discrimination and harassment claims. So here in Missouri, that's uh, the Missouri Commission on Human Rights. Or you can reach out to the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's the federal um, agency. If you're in Kansas City, there's also an agency um, that investigates complaints within the city under the ordinance. So I, I don't do a lot of I don't practice a lot in St. Louis, so I'm not sure if St. Louis has its own agency as well. That's kind of the, the process. But aren't folks often afraid that if they do voice very much of this, they could lose their job? That that I mean honestly as a practical matter is the possibility. But it would if if that were to happen, then we now jump into what's called retaliation, which is also against the law. Mm -hmm. So if someone makes a good faith complaint about discrimination or harassment, if they then suffer some sort of adverse action because of that complaint, then at that point, you know, the employer has engaged in retaliation, which is against the law. So I would, I would hope, you know, the optimist in me would say, you know, I would hope an employer would not terminate someone solely because they filed a complaint because that would be wrong. But, you know, I can understand why or how an employee might have that fear. I always tell folks, advocate for yourself and, you know, go through that process and make sure, you know, again, that you're letting the employer know what's going on. Now, if the employer makes a misstep and and does something egregious like that, then they've set themselves up for liability. I mean, you can't really escape that part. Yeah, you talked about, so if all this happens, you talked about, filing a complaint with either the state commission, federal level, or maybe even like local in Kansas City and possibly St. Louis. Do you recommend that the individual seeks an attorney to help them with that form and application to ensure that they're following the procedures correctly? Or is it supposed to be something that can be completed with just the individual's experience and perspective? And that, I think, would be a decision that would be up to the individual. So, I mean, you can certainly retain an attorney if you feel like, you know, that's necessary. The attorney would be there to guide you through that process. My experience has been, at least with, you know, the Missouri Commission on Human Rights, I spent a little bit of time there doing intake. So there's someone there that is at least going to ask you some of the high-level general questions about, you know, the nature of your complaint. They're not necessarily going to, like, help you fill out the form, but... You know, they'll go through, get sort of the high level information. You may fill out a questionnaire, I mean, which has, you know, pretty direct questions about the the issue or whatever the particular act may be. But like either way, filing the form is just sort of one way to uh, make sure that you've secured your rights if there if there is something, you know, that could rise to the level or constitute discrimination or harassment. Whether or not you get an attorney just because, you know, I don't think it's anything that is super complicated that requires an attorney. But I do understand, you know, why some folks may want to retain one just to kind of help them through what is essentially a legal process. How hard is it to make a case? I mean, employers usually have records of one kind or another about hiring and firing and things like that. Employee often doesn't keep track of things. They just just an internal feeling. So how hard is it to make a case? that you're being discriminated against or being harassed and make it substantial enough that it'll stick? Well, these are all like case by case Mm -hmm. situations, right? I've seen cases where it is extremely obvious because at the end of the day, when you get to the litigation piece, there's what's called discovery. And so both sides have to sort of exchange all the information that they have. And you're right, Bob, the employer tends to have more information than the employee, but you'd be surprised, you know, how much information an employer could have unknowingly that could potentially 
point to potential discrimination or harassment. Employers have to turn all that over, right, in the discovery process. So granted, employment discrimination cases are mostly circumstantial and are mostly going to be dependent upon witness credibility and things of that nature. So if it's a case where there's a witness who actually saw the exchange, then that's certainly going to be a case that's going to be easier, you know, for the employee to be able to prove. If you have emails where folks are saying things that they probably shouldn't be saying on company email, then that's going to be another case that, you know, might be a little bit easier for the employee to prove. But I don't know if it's very easy to quantify like how hard it is or whether or not a case can stick because every case has its own story and its own set of facts. They very often become uh, class action suits. You ever see one of those? I've seen a class action suit before, but it was a suit that was filed by the EEOC. And that's the Equal 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 Employment Opportunity Commission. So, you know, there are times where the EEOC may file a lawsuit on behalf of a group of employees and those I characterize those as as class actions at least in the employment discrimination room. The the cases very often go to trial where they settled out? Most cases settle. I think the the statistic is that you know only two percent of really all cases end up going to trial and I think that number is pretty reflective of employment discrimination cases as well. Trial is extremely costly, and it's it's fraught with risk. And so you also have, depending on whether you're in federal court or in state court, anywhere from, you know, 6 to 12 individuals who are going to decide whether or not the discrimination happened. And again, you know, as we talked about earlier, those individuals are shaped by, you know, their own individual experiences. And so you just never know how a case is going to come out if it does go to trial. You know, there are other other things that we could talk about regarding jurisdictions and things of that nature, but I think as a general proposition, most cases end up settling. When we talk about going to trial, and for that you have to file the suit, can you file the suit at any time, or do you have to file a complaint first with either the state or federal or local entity? So... Filing your, you know, the the term is charge of discrimination. So filing a charge of discrimination, if if you anticipate that you want to preserve your right to be able to file a lawsuit, then you must first file a charge of discrimination, um, and that is um, that is based on uh, the statute. So both the federal statute and um, our state statute require that you, what they call exhaust your administrative remedies before you are able to um, then file a lawsuit. So going back to the idea that you talked about of having people come together, figure out the issue and work together to solve it mm-hmm. in a peace, peaceful manner. And so the, the purpose of the charge, depending on who you talk to, right, it's certainly an administrative uh, mechanism that's built into the statute. My experience has been sometimes, you know, there's a process where, you know, it's investigated. Employers have to sort of write up a statement in response to the charge. There might be some other um, information gathered from the complainant, the person that filed the charge. Um, And then sometimes there may be a determination from the agency, which is sort of a formality. They may say, we don't find calls here, or maybe they do find calls, or maybe they punt. But you have to go through that process before you're able to file a lawsuit. Sometimes the agencies may offer the parties an opportunity to mediate. So the parties will come together, discuss you know, their, their perspectives on what occurred, and sometimes the, the matters can be settled through that mediation. And so that's one way, you know, folks were able to kind of come together and figure out how can we sort of remedy remedy this before we go on to litigation. I can see where once a case gets beyond the internal office settlement possibilities, once there is a case that is, that is finally settled without a trial, the whole process has created an, an antagonistic relationship now between the boss and the employer, employee. Do folks very often go back to work 
with somebody after there's been a settlement where somebody's had to admit, yeah, I probably didn't do this right? Well, so this is an interesting question. So I'll, I'll start at the point at which if it's a situation where there's been a, a separation, so the employee no longer works for the employer, and if there is a settlement reached, usually as part of that settlement, the parties will agree that they will not interact with each other at going forward, mm-hmm. right? So the the likelihood of the employee going back to the employer is almost zero. If it is a situation where the employee is still employed with the employer, and this has happened before, the employee is still working there, maybe they've tried to seek recourse internally, it didn't happen, they filed a charge, they remain employed throughout the process. Sometimes the parties agree that this relationship is so severed that as part of this settlement, employee is gonna walk away. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And the employee will continue to work even after the settlement has been reached with respect to whatever their particular discrimination or harassment claim might be. And it's still, I think in those situations, it's probably a bit tenuous. I haven't had any experiences where the relationship remained and maybe there was like another issue. Like I haven't personally had that experience. Maybe some of my colleagues have, but those are usually the three scenarios that you could sort of deal with. And I mean, at that point, you know, if the employee remains employed and if they're able to do so harmoniously, of course, that that's always ideal. But I think as a practical matter, it can be a little bit difficult depending on the nature of the claim. We've learned in other episodes that oftentimes laws that pertain to businesses only pertain to businesses of a certain size and larger. Is that true with employment discrimination or or harassment? So, yes. Yeah, so the Missouri Human Rights Act provides protections and is comes into play if you have six or more employees. So, so relatively small shop. Then. Yeah. yeah. The federal statutes, um, Title Seven, the ADA, which deals with disability discrimination. I believe the ADEA as well. I believe it's 15 employees. You're testing me today, Farrah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's. I think it's good for folks to know that for the majority of our listeners, they probably are employed somewhere that would be held to the standards under the law right? that we've been discussing. Correct. You mentioned disability. Do you get very many discrimination or harassment suits based on disabilities? Uh, I would say yes. Disabilities... It's interesting because, of course, you have those disabilities that folks can very readily see, but then you also have sort of invisible disabilities, those impairments that are not visible to the naked eye. Sometimes, you know, in order for an employer to know that they're dealing with an employee that has a particular type of disability that isn't readily apparent, there again has to be a conversation had. Sometimes an employer may be able to put two and two together, like if there's maybe issues with absences or something like that, but it's not, the employer doesn't have to be like clairvoyant. So again, there has to be communication between the employee and the employer, alerting the employer to a need if, if there is one. And, and sometimes, you know, if a case is brought and it's a disability discrimination case and it is based on a disability that maybe is you know, um, a mental health condition or, you know, some sort of autoimmune issue that, again, isn't readily apparent, you know, those cases can get a little bit difficult because, again, it's all about sort of circumstantial evidence at that point in time. If, if you're presenting to me as a person who is able to move about without any issues, and you have all your limbs, we're able to communicate interpersonally just fine, and you have maybe depression or bipolar or whatever, and I'm I'm not aware of that as your manager, it's very difficult for you to say that any decisions that I made, you know, were based on a disability I had no awareness of. How about religion? Uh, Many people have special holidays or various other time periods where something is special. Does that that come into the the area of discrimination very often? Um, I, I don't, my experience is not necessarily very often, but I would also still go back to what I said about, you know, communication and 
you know, I know, for example, um, there are a lot of Jewish holidays that are about to come up. I, I am aware of that sort of at a high level, but I don't have an intimate knowledge of it. But, you know, to the extent someone is Jewish and celebrates those holidays and needs that time off or any other accommodation related to that, then the law provides for reasonable accommodations for religion, so long as it's a sincerely held belief. But again, you have to reach out to your employer and let them know that, you know, you have a desire to, you know, seek that accommodation so that they can um, respond and make a way. Should, uh, should every business have a human rights office, a human rights department? Or maybe to, to do a little self-promotion, a lawyer on hand to consult with? <laughs> <laughs> I think every employer should always have a lawyer on hand just because... Employment discrimination is just a very small subset of employment law as a whole. There's so much out there with respect to legislation as it relates to employee relations and then other aspects of employment law. And I think that also is reflected with respect to any like human resources department. Human resources deals with everything from employee relations to benefits to wages so on and so forth. And so it's certainly incumbent upon employers to have human resources departments, but to also make sure that their human resources personnel, you know, are trained in the gamut of, um, again, the alphabet soup and all of the different, you know, laws that are going to apply to employers and how they relate to their employees, because it, it, it is a lot. And again, we're just talking about a very small section of what that looks like. So other than moving your employee handbook to the top of your must-read list, <laughs> what do you think is the, if, if listeners are taking away one core thing from the employee's perspective, what would that be? Again, communication. I believe it's important for people in all forums to advocate for themselves. But I think in order, big part of advocation or advocating is is communication and interaction. So yes, definitely read the employee handbook, but also if you have a concern, make sure that you're raising those concerns with your immediate supervisor or with your human resources department so that at the very least, there isn't a situation where, you know, you're suffering in silence and you're also offering the employer an opportunity to respond to whatever your concerns might be. I truly believe that employers want to have really great working environments. I really do believe that. And so in order to meet that end as an employee, I believe, you know, you have a responsibility to give the employer the opportunity to create a better more inclusive work environment. Is communication also what you would recommend to business owners to be the one thing if they take away anything? I would say, I don't know if communication would be my number one for employers, right? I think perhaps communication in a way of making sure that, you know, you have the policies in place so that your employees know what recourse is available, you know, to them if they have an issue um, that comes up. I would say being mindful with respect to, you know, the personalities and the people that you bring into your workforce. I think being mindful of sort of your leadership and what they outwardly display. If your goal is to have an inclusive work environment, I think leadership needs to reflect inclusivity and sort of have an open door atmosphere that will then facilitate that communication. Excellent. We spent a lot of time today talking about human rights and uh, human resources, and I guess the key word to remember is human, because anytime, anytime you've got two humans, people are going to see things differently, and there needs to be a way that they can talk to each other about it, resolve any differences they have, and uh, sometimes it takes a structure to do that. We're glad that you've been with us, Camille. This has been a great program today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bob and Vera. Before we go, this program series is focusing on a lot of our basic individual rights to shed some light on the U.S. Constitution and the rights we have under it. Here's the Missouri Bar Citizenship Education Director, Tony Simons, to tell us more. I would like to look back at one of the first decisions of the United States Supreme Court dealing with workplace discrimination and how it opened the door for the robust protection of workers we have today. In Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
Congress addressed workplace discrimination. Specifically, Section 703 stated that it shall be an unlawful employment practice for an employer to limit, segregate, or classify his employees in any way which would deprive or tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect his status as an employee because of such individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. This provision would be at the center of one of the first Supreme Court decisions dealing with workplace discrimination. Duke Power Company discriminated against black applicants and employees for years. The company openly discriminated on the basis of race in the hiring and assigning of employees at its Dan River plant. The plant was organized into five operating departments, labor, coal handling, operations, maintenance, and laboratory testing. Black employees were only allowed to work in the labor department where the highest paying jobs paid less than the lowest paying jobs in the other four operating departments in which the employees were only white. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Duke Power had to come up with a new strategy. When the company was forced in 1965 to abandon its policy of restricting black employees to the labor department, it instituted a new policy that a high school diploma was required to transfer from the labor department to any other department. Since only 12% of the black population in North Carolina had a high school diploma at this time, this requirement kept the vast majority of black employees from transferring to any other department. The company also added an additional requirement. To qualify for placement in any department other than labor, employees were required to pass two professionally prepared aptitude tests. As the Supreme Court would observe when it considered this case, neither the high school completion requirement nor the general intelligence test was shown to bear a demonstrable relationship to successful performance of the jobs for which it was used. Both were adopted without meaningful study of their relationship to job performance ability. This new requirement was challenged as a violation of the Civil Rights Act by 13 black employees at Duke Power Company's Dan River Steam Station. The district court ruled in favor of Duke Power. The court reasoned that these standards had been applied equally to white and black employees alike. If standards were applicable to all races, then discrimination was not present. The workers appealed, but failed to convince the Court of Appeals. This court stated that a subjective test of the employer's intent should govern and wanted to see evidence of the discriminatory intent of the company. When the workers were unable to produce this evidence, the Court of Appeals upheld the district court decision against the workers. There was no showing of a discriminatory purpose in the adoption of the diploma and test requirements. On this basis, the Court of Appeals concluded there was no violation of the act. The case was then appealed to the United States Supreme Court. In the 1971 case of Griggs versus Duke Power, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the workers and concluded that the program used by the company violated the Civil Rights Act. A unanimous court emphasized that subjective intent is not the key inquiry. If barriers are created, regardless of the intent of the company, then the act is violated. Writing for the court, Chief Justice Warren Burger stated, what is required by Congress is the removal of artificial, arbitrary, and unnecessary barriers to employment when the barriers operate invidiously to discriminate on the basis of racial or other impermissible classification. The objective of Congress in the enactment of Title VII is plain from the language of the statute. 
It was to achieve equality of employment opportunities and remove barriers that have operated in the past to favor an identifiable group of white employees over other employees. Under the Act, practices, procedures, or tests, neutral on their face and even neutral in terms of intent, cannot be maintained if they operate to freeze the status quo of prior discriminatory employment practices. Chief Justice Berger stated the conclusion of the court bluntly. The act prescribes not only overt discrimination, but also practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory in operation. If the Supreme Court had gone along with the approach taken by the District Court and Court of Appeals, requiring that discriminatory intent had to be established, the impact of the law would have been minimized. Companies would have been able to camouflage their discriminatory intent and elude the requirements of the law. Instead, the Supreme Court stated that the focus of the law was not discriminatory intent, but rather discriminatory effect. With this decision, the Supreme Court set into motion an approach that would allow the Civil Rights Act to address workplace discrimination in a meaningful way. There are some more resources you might want to check out at MissouriLawyersHelp.org. Again, that's MissouriLawyersHelp, all one word, dot org. You can find an array of other information on various legal topics at the same site. The site provides this information to help you better understand the law, because the more you know about the law, the better decisions you can make for your life, your family, and your finances. Nothing further, Your Honor. You've been listening to Is It Legal 2, a regular look at our legal system and you. It's a special production of the Missouri Bar. I'm Bob Pretty. And I'm Farah Fight. Thanks for being with us. Opinions and positions stated by guests and presenters in the Is It Legal 2 podcast are those of the guests and presenters and not necessarily those of the Missouri Bar. This program is intended as information for lawyers and citizens of Missouri in conjunction with other research they deem necessary in the exercise of their independent judgment.